Welcome to everyone. Greetings to everyone who's watching online at home this evening. Uh, we thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we ask that you continue to pray for all those who are on the prayer list. Requests that have been received since this past Sunday include Aubrey Bryan, Cole and Regina Esslinger, the Brady family, Sarah Otto. Uh, we also are, are asked to remember Lynn and Betty Hervey as Lynn has been put on hospice recently. And our sympathy goes out to Aurora Overton and her family as Aurora's son, Raul Salazar, had passed away. His service will be September 6th. And also our sympathy goes out to Jessa Lou Blair and her family. Her husband, Roland, had recently passed away. They were former members here, uh, and he was a deacon some time ago. The upcoming events, um, as today is the, the last of our summer series, next week we'll be starting a, a new series of classes on so Wednesday September 2nd in the evening we will have two adult classes available uh, there will be a ladies class in room 7 which will be starting out in person only uh, and there will also be an adult class here in the fellowship hall which will be uh, streaming through Facebook live the 6th through 12th graders will be having a class in room 5 starting next Wednesday uh, at 7 o'clock, which Kenneth will be planning on streaming as well as having in person. The Wednesday morning ladies class will be resuming on September 9th uh, at 10 a.m. in room 7. And the Thursday men's Bible class will resume on September 24th at a new time, uh, likely at noon here in the fellowship hall. So if as we start class this evening, if you please bow with me. Almighty Father, we love you so very much. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together as fellow Christians, to study your word, to encourage each other, and to learn how to grow closer to you. Lord, we're so thankful for the time where we are spending in study. We ask you, Lord, during this time that you open our hearts, open our minds, and help us to inspect our own lives and receive the message that we're to hear this evening, that we receive it and that we apply it to our daily lives. Lord, we pray for all those on the prayer list, those who are hurting in so many different ways. Lord, you are the great physician. You are the healer that, that can give us everything that we need. We ask that you be with all those who are on the prayer list, that your healing hand be on them. All these things we pray, Lord, through your Son, Jesus. Amen. Our first song this evening is entitled, The Gospel is for All. If you're at home and following along with a hymnal, it's number 632. <clears throat> of one the Lord has made the race, through one has come the fall. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. Received ye freely, freely give, from every land they call. Unless they hear, they cannot live, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. If you'd like to follow along, you can mark our invitation song as number 674 in the hymnal. There's a great day coming. Again, we want to welcome those that are here tonight. And um, I do have a, a quick announcement that Stephen didn't have at that time. I just got a, a news that Aubrey Bryant will, is planning to go home Friday. So that's very good news after being in the hospital for many weeks he plans to go home Friday, still recovering, uh, but we're very happy uh, to announce that and happy for B and Aubrey. Well, this is our last week of our summer series. Uh, it's been a, quite a bit different this summer, 
and we have uh, met here in the fellowship hall with uh, not many people present because of the circumstances that we're facing, uh, but we've had many that have joined us on Facebook and later on YouTube, and hopefully these lessons, because they're there for the foreseeable future, they'll be helpful to anyone that's really searching for reasons to become a Christian. And I want to thank all the men who spoke this summer and gave lessons. I'm going to list them because uh, there are about nine, nine total. Uh, Kevin Hunt, Stephen Montgomery, Wayne Pinkley, of course, that's Kenneth's father that was with us this summer visiting. Uh, Reagan Hammett, Stephen Charleboy, Kenneth Pinkley, Larry Sanchez, and Levi Stark. And all those men did a great job for the lessons that they had. We appreciate them. And I hope that as we go through the lesson tonight, it, it it really serves as really a, a, one of those final lessons that will hopefully uh, be a good bookend, you might say, to the lessons we've learned this summer. I'm going to give the invitation at the beginning of service, and we're going to sing that song at the end. Uh, but I want to make it a, a point to say, I know those that are here today, as I look around, are all members of the church and have been baptized into Christ at some point. But I also know there are many who may see this or may be watching that may not be members of the Lord's church. You may never have been baptized for the remission of your sins. And we learn in Scripture, the whole summer has been focused on 13 reasons why you should become a Christian. And uh, for those that are Christians, it's been a reminder, hopefully, of how blessed we are to be children of God and adopted as sons of God, as we find in Scripture, and we looked at that this summer. Uh, But the whole point of this is that if you're searching and want to know, What is there about Christianity that would uh, be a good reason or many of the reasons why you should become a Christian? Uh, These are them. And, of course, becoming a Christian involves belief that Jesus is God's son and confessing him as the son of God. A part of becoming a Christian also includes repentance. And really that is the turning away from sin to giving our life up to God instead of living it as we often do, selfishly with our own line of thinking, our own way of going through life. And uh, in serving ourselves first, we change when we turn and we serve God. And we, again, go by His guidance, His commandments, His instruction, and we are obedient to Him. And so repentance is definitely an important part of becoming a child of God. And then, of course, baptism. You You can't escape baptism when you read the New Testament. When the church was established on the day of Pentecost, according to Acts chapter 2, The people asked, what shall we do? They realized they had sinned, they had put Christ to death. And Peter answered in a simple way, but it's very profound, to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And that was his answer, and that's our answer today, to anyone searching, to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And of course, Scripture teaches us that baptism includes more than just being immersed in water. It includes God forgiving our sins at that point. Uh, through that, through that, those waters of baptism. Actually, the Apostle Paul describes the gospel itself in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, as the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And he mentions in 1 Corinthians 15 that not only did he teach that and preach that, but he was saved by that, as the Christians in Corinth were, and as we are 2,000 years later. And then we also find in Romans chapter 6, that same Apostle Paul describes baptism saying that we are immersed into Christ, and when we do so, we're buried with him in baptism unto death, and that we're raised to walk in newness of life, just as Christ was raised from the dead. Again, that's obedience to the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And I would like to say, as far as the invitation is concerned, that we have a baptistry that's always ready here at Weber Road to baptize anyone at any time. We don't have a special service once a month or once a quarter, to baptize those who want and and realize they need to be baptized. We'll baptize at any time, at any time of the day, uh, 24 hours a day. You can call us, and we'll make sure that we meet you here, and and we'll make sure that we'll baptize you. If you're perhaps listening from a place other than Corpus Christi, I will say that if you don't have a faithful Church of Christ in your area, you can call us, contact us, and we'll make sure that we put you in contact with someone in your area that will help you to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's the invitation, and we're going to, again, sing that invitation song at the end of our service tonight. Uh, But to let you know, again, 13 reasons why you should become a Christian. 
These are the 13 reasons, 12 of those we've already looked at. Tonight is the final. And I'm going to read through these. Consider how blessed you are if you are a Christian. That you'll find meaning and purpose in life. Secondly, for release from guilt and regret. Thirdly, your prayers will be heard by God as his children. Number four, to fully know God's love for you. Number five, is you'll have hope for the future. Number six, to have a new lease on life. Number seven is it provides an alternative to all the confusion in life. And isn't there a lot of confusion today? Number eight, that your family and friends will certainly be blessed by you becoming a Christian. Number nine is there's a place to belong and also be loved. And that's within the confines, you could say, of the Lord's church, his body, uh, uh, the body of Christ, which is the church. Number 10, for escape from the troubles of life. Number 11, to find true and lasting happiness. Number 12, Kenneth covered this last week, for a lifetime guarantee of God's forgiveness as we submit to his will. And then tonight, of course, you probably can see it on the screen behind me, the 13th reason that we would submit to you that you should become a Christian is so that you can have ultimate victory. In 490 B.C., there was a great battle between two world empires, the Persians and the Athenians or the Greeks. It was fought in the ancient town of Marathon. It was about 22 miles, actually, from the city of Athens. The battle was very fierce, according to all accounts, and it resulted in the defeat of the Persians. Well, there was a lone messenger, according to the tradition, named Pheidippides, who ran from that battlefield at Marathon all the way to Athens, some 22 miles, and he was bringing news of the Greek or the Athenian victory. And after entering the city, according to the story at least, he shouted, Rejoice, we conquer! And then he fell dead to the ground. He had died of exhaustion. And it was in 1896, about 124 years ago, that the modern Olympic Games were revived in Athens. And they came up with a 26-mile, 365-yard run called the marathon and we all know what a marathon is today but as we look through the bible we continually see god's people those who are saved those who we call protected by god when we follow his will as people who face you might say common and some of the not so common problems and difficulties in life now the apostle paul is a good example of that a great follower of god when he had turned his life over to the lord and obeyed the gospel He went around preaching, yet, even as a faithful Christian, he faced a lot of hardship. He wrote about many of those instances. He faced trials. His life was threatened. He was persecuted throughout his life for his preaching. He was beaten. He was stoned. He was imprisoned, he tells us. He was shipwrecked. And yet, Paul was still able to live victoriously in Christ. As mentioned, for the last reason that you should become a Christian and that we we can be we can know that we're blessed that we are Christians, we can have ultimate victory as children of God. And you wonder, what was Paul's secret? You know, all the things that happened to him that we would consider very negative might get someone down in life and discouraged and just want to give up altogether. But what we know, Paul overcame his past as a persecutor of God, of the church, of Christians. He was a part of Uh, stoning Stephen, for example. We know that he was a part of an execution there and also imprisoning Christians for practicing their faith. Uh, Yet we know that he also persecuted in doing so Christ himself, he found out later on the road to Damascus. But he wrote about his hope in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8, he had a confident expectation. And what he said there is, if God is for us, who can be against us? And what a great passage to think about, just a few words that can really be uplifting to those that are faithful children of God. It's found in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. You see, Paul seemed to know beyond all shadow of a doubt that God was now on his side. And he knew that even during the roughest of circumstances in his life that he faced, he had an awesome promise from God that he was for Paul. And not only... God for Paul, not only was he for those Christians to whom Paul was writing in Rome, but we know that God is for all his children throughout all the ages, through the centuries since then, and for any century to come, until Christ comes again, of course. 
And let's go ahead and read this passage before we begin the, the lesson. We have two main points tonight. They won't be very long. Romans chapter 8, 31 through 39. And again, this is one of those passages that if you're down and out, discouraged, and feel like you're struggling, even in your Christian life, this is a passage that kind of you know, gives you a foundation and a bearing to how to handle those difficulties. Because Paul lays it right out, exactly what we face and how we can look at it. He says there in Romans eight thirty one, What shall we say to these things? He said, If God is for us, who can be against us? He says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he says, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. He said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or, or danger, or sword, he says. He said, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, he says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He says, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, what a beautiful passage that reminds us just how blessed we are as the children of God. There's an old Roman legend, I don't know if it's true or not, makes a good story though, (laughs) that uh, there was an emperor returning from victory with the spoils of war. And he paraded down the streets of Rome, and all the people gathered around to watch his triumphal procession through Rome. And as they chanted while he passed by, the soldiers lined the streets to protect him from the outreached arms of the crowd. Kind of reminds you of maybe a politician today, uh, maybe a a celebrity that has bodyguards that are protecting that individual. It was during that procession that says that a little boy, an emperor's son, he jumped off the royal platform and started running between all the people says that he darted between a guard's legs and sped toward the emperor. The soldier grabbed him by the neck and said, Boy, you can't go up there. Don't you know who that is? That's the emperor. To which the boy looked at him with a smile and said, Mister, he may be your emperor, but he's my father. And you think about a story like that as far as we are concerned. And we can say certainly God is our Lord. He is supreme. He is the creator of the universe. But he is also our father. He loves us dearly. He wants the best for us in our life. He only wants for us to be blessed and for us to find happiness despite any difficulty that we might face in life. And God is our Father who never forsakes us. And we can forsake Him. We can rebel against Him. And we can reject His message and His word. But God will never forsake us because He's always on our side. He wants us to do what's right. And He'll bless us when we do. Every time you turn the corner, if you're doing wrong, God's going to oppose you. Believe that, and he says that, and he even disciplines us in ways the Scripture teaches. But God wants you to do what's right, and he'll always encourage you to. You find that throughout Scripture. He always wants us to turn to him, and he always wants us, again, for the best in our life. And so first of all, we're going to see this phrase that Paul tells us, or uses, that God is for us. And it should make you feel very good when someone says that they're for you. We've all probably had instances in our life where we could say, somebody really picked me up and encouraged me because they believed in me. You know, if you're fired from your job, let's say, maybe for an unjust reason, there's nothing to it. Maybe your fellow workers would come and tell you, you know what, that's not fair, we're going to stick up for you, even if we lose our job. That's not right what they've done to you. And if that were to happen, again, and you had cause to be fired by your boss for an unjust reason, that'd make you feel pretty special for other people to really stick up for you and put a good word in for you and really stand in, in, your, in your stead, you might say. Let's say you're disparaged by someone, and then a friend or someone who knows you comes to your defense and stands up with you and tells people, this is what you are like. It's not what this other person is spreading. Again, that's what a good coach, a good teacher, that's what a good supervisor does well. They give you confidence by the words that they use, the encouragement that they give you, 
the responsibility maybe they, they give you because they, again, know you can handle those things in life. Motivational speakers that are very good, coaches, are often quoted for words that become known to many. Now, I think about some of the most famous ones, people like Yogi Berry did it in a comical way. You have people like John Wooden or uh, those that are often quoted. Uh, Lou Holtz is quoted a lot today. Zig Ziglar is a speaker that many of you may be familiar with that came up with good words or quotes that encourage people. Tony Robbins nowadays. There are many others. But consider this, what Paul said. I mean, it, it, it was true 2,000 years ago. It's always been true, and it's true today, that God is for us. And he's writing to the Christians there in Rome, remember. But that's a pretty awesome statement when you think about it, that God, who is our supreme being, he is the only creator of the universe. He would be the King of kings and Lord of lords, Heavenly Father, as he's described in Scripture. He is for you and me. And he is for us, although he's on our side. And I mean, so much so, we consider what he did for us in giving his son and allowing his son to be crucified on a cruel cross in a very vicious and, and torturous way. Yet he did that because he loves us so much. And scripture is full of words that ought to make every man and woman that pays attention to those passages respond to God with loving obedience. And it ought to make every Christian, when we really consider what God has done for us and how much he loves us, it ought to make each one of us live life with confidence, knowing that God loves us so much. There's a couple of passages I'll read to you. There are many others, but one of those that really is a special passage that tells us exactly how God sees us through his eyes. In, second, in 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 and 10, it says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And again, what a wonderful passage that ought to pick up any discouraged person when you realize that if you're a Christian, that God sees you in such a special way, and he considers us, his people, that we have received mercy, then, again, we are not just any people, we are God's people. And so, again, read that over and over, especially if you're discouraged in your Christian life. And to the children of Israel, after they were led from Egyptian bondage, this is what God told his people way back in Leviticus, chapter 26, verse 12. He promised them, he said, I will walk with you and will be your God and you will be my people. And that's very similar to the passage, again, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2. And uh, again, God wants to be our people. And you wonder how passages like that, I mean, again, make us feel. Hopefully, they make you feel and respond in a way that's very positive in life. And, and realize that we are special in God's eyes. And, and I know I often like to say, I've heard this before, that we are the pinnacle of God's creation. You know, as beautiful as this majestic world is sometimes, and you can get some beautiful scenery out there, and you, some of you have gone on vacation, and, and you have gone to places that just are, make you look at them in awe. Mankind is the pinnacle of God's creation. He loved mankind so much that he sent his son to die for us. And so realize that's how much he loves us. No matter what you see in yourself, God loves you more than anyone could possibly love you. And we should also be humbled that the Almighty God who created this world is 100% behind you as far as you seeking eternal happiness. And despite any weaknesses that we have, any faults or flaws or mistakes that we make, even sins we commit, realize that no matter what, God loves us. And He wants the best for us in life and wants us to follow Him. I know that I'm one of God's children, and I know many of you are, those that are many of you here today that have been baptized into Christ. And it doesn't really matter, again, if you hit home runs in life every day or if you strike out. It doesn't matter if, uh, you know, you drop the ball as you would have it. Realize God loves us, and He is on our side. He wants us to always be happy in Him and in Christ. That's what we looked at throughout the whole summer. You know, how many of you remember Tom and Jerry cartoons? And some of those will take you back to your childhood, especially if you're a little bit older. Um, Tom was the cat, and he was always trying to catch and eat Jerry the mouse. 
think he caught him a couple of times. Jerry got, got loose, though. But the series was pretty silly, pretty predictable, uh, a lot of uh, cartoon-type humor and, and violence, I guess. But in one of those cartoon stories, Jerry rescued Spike, who was a bulldog, and he rescued him from the dog catcher. And uh, out of his gratitude, Spike tells Jerry, anytime you need help, just whistle. And, and in that particular cartoon, Jerry quickly learned, hey, I can call Spike at any time. Anytime Tom's chasing me and he's after me, I'll just whistle. And, and it's amazing in the, in the cartoon how true it is in life again that he was pretty bold and confident as a little mouse being chased by a, a cat. He became very confident when he had Spike there to back him up. Because he knew Spike was pretty powerful, and he was a good protector. And the truth is, when you realize the one that is for you, and that fights for you, and that has given his son so that you might live eternally, that if you realize that, if you center your life on that fact, it doesn't matter who's against you in life, realize that God is for us. And that leads us to our second thought, our last thought for this evening. Since God is for us, Nothing can defeat us, as we read in Romans chapter 8. Life can be tough. Obviously, it can be very difficult. Uh, Trouble can find us. Uh, Tragedy can certainly come our way. Uh, Struggles are often part of life. And I know many that are here today or listening have obviously uh, dealt with those things in life. And if we're not careful, we can become and feel very defeated in life. And there are many people that are discouraged and get down and pretty much give up on life and even give up on God. Jesus himself said, in this world you will have trouble. And that's found in John chapter 16, verse 33. He said that to his disciples on that day, but it's really to all his followers throughout the ages. And I think most of us already know that. And uh, if you're like most people, you've already had your share of troubles. Everyday troubles include could include the loss of a job or financial difficulties, uh, sicknesses and disease. could be relationship problems that people have, family problems with children or spouses or other family members. could be divorce or the death of a friend or a loved one. And I think we could say that we could go on and on with that list of difficulties that people face. And I guess the, the big difficulty many face today is a virus that many people are Uh, experiencing right now in our world and if you have not had any of those experiences then uh, you're pretty rare (laughs) there's not many people that could say I've never had a problem never had a struggle in life you'd be the exception to every rule I've ever heard and uh, the longer you live though the most more likely it is that you're going to face those common problems and also some not so common problems we're warned of times of trouble actually in a passage like 2 Timothy chapter 4, or 3, verses 1 through 5. This is what Paul said. He said, in the last days, there'll come times of difficulty. Now, it's possible that Paul was speaking about in the last days when Jerusalem would be destroyed in about 70 A.D., but the same principle is true, and we find this throughout the ages until Christ comes again, whenever that might be, because these fit today, as we see. He says, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, inappeasable, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. And Paul says, avoid such people. You know, the real problem lies not in the fact that there are problems in this life, and we all face them again. But the question is, who do we blame when life gives us trouble and the circumstances of our life are difficult? Those of you that are over 30 years old probably remember when the United States was attacked on September 11, 2001. It was about 19 years ago, coming up on 19 years. And there were many (coughs) that had political differences, as they always have, they have today. But many of you might remember just, uh, again, as those differences were very evident in the political world and all throughout the world, the plea from the president at that time, which happened to be President George Bush, and it's interesting, from so many politicians that sometimes 
want nothing to do with this particular thing in schools or in public or what have you. How many of them got on television or throughout the media and encouraged Americans to pray? It was amazing to me to know see that. And some of you are shaking your head because you remember those, again, politicians and leaders and celebrities, and it seemed like everyone during a time of great disaster and struggle when we were attacked. Obviously, they were trying to point people to prayer because they realized, again, that we're not in total control, that only a God could be in control. They asked that we pray that God be with our nation during that trying time. And it was one young lady that was interviewed on the streets of New York City, particularly. And she exclaimed this. She said, pray? Pray to whom? She then added, either there is no God or he's the one who caused all of this. You think about a statement like that. And you wonder if that's exactly what Satan wants people to believe. That all the bad things that happen, all the circumstances that we face that are difficult, all the struggles, all the illness, everything in life that's bad, God's fault. And and there are those that that blame God. Troubles don't come from God. They do come from Satan in a world that he is, we find in 1 Peter chapter 5, we'll study this Sunday, that he has power over. And he has influence over this world in which we live. And the system that this world lives by. And it thrills Satan, you know. That people blame God for what he is behind. And, uh, you know, Satan's trying to destroy us. His scripture continually warns us. He uses people. He can use governments. He can use ideas. He can use tragedy. He can use circumstances that we go through. The struggles, the disease that we have in life. Any difficult circumstances in an effort to defeat us and to in some way cause us to turn against God and blame God for all of our problems in life. But he's the one that's actually trying to destroy us and devour us, and he does deceive many. He's actually like a roaring lion, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 teaches us. Yet Paul said, with God on our side, realize that there is absolutely nothing that Satan can do to destroy your relationship with God when you choose to be faithful to Him and trust and obey Him. And that relationship is secure because, first of all, God is faithful 100%. He'll never do anything that will cause you to go to hell on His part. And we show our faithfulness in that right relationship by our trust and obedience to God. This is what Jeremiah wrote in the Old Testament, way back in Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 4. These are the words of God from the, uh, from the writing of Jeremiah. He said, I command, commanded your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace saying, listen to my voice and do all that I command. So shall you be my people and I will be your God. And isn't that the same sentiment, the same words, the, the same encouragement that the Lord gives us throughout scripture? That if we follow God, that if we do what he says, follow his commands, If you do that, that you'll be his people and that he'll be your God. And if you'd like an absolute promise that everything will essentially and eventually work out in your life, a promise that is a guarantee, you might say, oh, oh, that's not possible. There's no guarantee that everything's going to work out in my life. Realize that there is a guarantee from God. And notice what this guarantee involves. And this is what it says actually in Psalm 37 verses 4 through 5 and The psalmist tells us here in a very enlightening way. He says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean sinful desires. It doesn't mean those things that God doesn't want for your life, that he has no purpose for. But the things that, again, when you delight yourself in the Lord, you're going to change. Your heart's going to change. You're going to be transformed, as we find in New Testament, into the image of his son. And it says he will give you the desires of your heart, whatever you desire. Uh, Again, for the Lord, uh, he says that he will give you those desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, the psalmist says. Trust in him and he will act. And that's trust and obedience, as I mentioned a few times here tonight. After Jesus said to his disciples that this world, in this world, you'll have trouble. In John 16, verse 33. Notice what he said just after that, in the same verse. He went on to say, but take courage, I have overcome the world. And you can look at that and know that Jesus has paved the way to our victory because he has victory over death. 
Paul gives five truths about God being for us. Those five truths are found, again, in Romans 8, what we read, verses 31 through 39. He says, who shall oppose us? Who shall accuse us? Who will condemn us? Who will separate us? And who will conquer us? And, of course, the obvious answer is absolutely no one. Nothing can, again, destroy our faith because God is for us. Again, you have to look at Scripture and say that we can rebel against God and leave Him and reject Him. But realize that when we live for God and show our faithfulness to Him, nothing will stand in our way. And I know it may be difficult, obviously, for some to grasp that concept. And you may be looking at a life right now, again, that you had a lot of promise for, and now you have heartaches. And you may think, you know, no one's on my side, as many people feel today. Or I can't possibly be positive with things that are going on in the world. Or I'm a failure at everything I touch. And there are many that feel that way. And I have a a life that just is pretty miserable today. And you may look at your struggle with sin and temptation and think, there's no way God is looking out for me. You know, not after what I've done. Not after how I've treated him or how I've treated others. But it's during those problems and those heartaches It's during the struggles and even sin and temptation in our life when we need God most and we need to turn to Him. It's when God steps in and says, I am on your side. You can count on me, but you must come to me. And you must receive what I have given you, and that's my Son who died in your stead. And you must obey my commands. And when people ask where to turn to in the Bible, when they deal with things like depression or struggles uh, with discouragement in life, I usually point them to the Psalms. It's a real safe place to go when you're feeling discouraged. There are many passages throughout the Psalms uh, that can really help someone that's really down and out in life. And I would encourage you to look throughout the Psalms. And it won't be long until you run into a a Psalm that really picks you up and encourages you. One of those is Psalm 91. I'll read verses 1 through 6 where he says, the psalmist says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. He says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the follower, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shelter and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. In Matthew 13, verse 15, and also that's repeated from Isaiah chapter 6, listen to these words. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. In those same words, are found throughout Scripture. God will heal the brokenhearted, and He will heal those that are maybe wrapped up in a life of consequences because of sin and bad choices. The Lord will heal, and we have that promise even today. And if you're a Christian, I would encourage you not to let Satan warp your thinking that God does not love you and that God is the cause of all of your problems. The world will tell you that. Satan wants you to believe that. But God is good, and he will, you you could say we can never repay him for all that he has done for us and how he has blessed us. All he asks in return is our love for him. And he asks us to love him in return, to serve him, and to obey him, and be eternally grateful that he is on our side. In Psalm 118, verse 6, it says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So why should you become a Christian? Because you have ultimate victory through Christ with God as your father, a father who will never let us down. And even when we mess up in our lives, he wants us to repent and turn to him again. Until the day of our death, when our eternity will be sealed by the judgment of Christ himself, we will stand before his judgment seat. We have the opportunity to follow God. And we can know that he will never give up on us. Remember the parable of the prodigal son. Even those that left, the prodigal son as he left, He lived a life. He wasted his inheritance. But who was it at the end that was waiting for him to return home? 
Of course, it was his father. And that really is a story about our father in heaven wanting us to return to him if we ever find ourselves in, in a life of sin. As we close, before we sing the invitation in just a moment, I'll tell you a story and then we'll close. There's a man named Dick Hoyt. Some of you may have heard about him, and you might remember this after I start telling the story. <clears throat> but he had a son that was born with his umbilical cord wrapped around his neck, and it caused his son to lose oxygen to his brain at birth. He became disabled. This disabled boy's name was Rick. He was born in 1962, which would make him today 58 years old. He is still living, and so is his father. <clears throat> but Rick's parents, Dick and Judy, were told that their firstborn son would be what they called at that time a vegetable. And the doctors advised them to put him in an institution because he wouldn't be able to live a normal life. Well, they refused. His parents were convinced that Rick deserved a chance to lead a, a normal life, just as normal as possible. And so they took him home. Rick had two younger brothers, eventually, and he grew up with his parents that made every effort to give him the same opportunities his, brother had, or his brothers had, they struggled to have Rick admitted to public school. They actually had to prove his intelligence and ability to participate to the leadership at the schools. Rick had to learn to communicate. He actually used an alphabet system that was uh, created by his brother, younger brother. And he would actually nod his head to select certain letters to spell out words. Pretty amazing. Back in, again, the 1970s. Rick also, at the age of 10, 1972 that would have been, received what we would call a specialized computer uh, that allowed him to click a button with his head to select letters and words. Uh, Rick's slight head movements were the only movements that he was ever able to control. When Rick was 13, uh, a student in his community became paralyzed because of a lacrosse accident, and the school organized a five-mile benefit run. Rick came home from school. He communicated to his dad that he wanted to run the event. Well, Dick had not run, his father had not run since high school. He agreed to push Rick in his wheelchair. And so Dick said that while he was running, <clears throat> Rick flashed the biggest smile you ever saw in your life. And after that event, back at home, Rick spelled out on his computer, Dad, I felt like I wasn't handicapped. Well, since that first event, the Hoyts, the Hoyt, Team Hoyt, they call them today, continued to run and compete. They're retired at this time, the father is at least. At first, they ran 5Ks and 10Ks, then half marathons, and then full marathons. It was not until they had tried to enter several times they were finally allowed to enter into the Boston Marathon in 1981. They ran 32 Boston Marathons. They have totaled over 1,130 1, endurance events in their life together. That included, again, I'm just giving you these numbers, they're amazing, 257 triathlons, 72 full marathons, and 97 half marathons. Team Hoyt, as they're called, actually has a bronze statue that stands near the start of the Boston Marathon today. They were inducted into the Ironman Hall of Fame several years ago. And by the way, those triathlons, the competitors have to swim two and a half miles through a body of water, sometimes the ocean, then pedal a bicycle 112 miles, and then run a marathon, about 26 miles. And the triathlon swim, Rick would lie on his back in a rubber raft attached to a vest. His father would swim and pull him along. In the bike portion, Rick would sit in a chair attached to the front of his father's bike. And on the run, Dick would push Rick in a race chair. Well, Dick Hoyt was a retired colonel from the National Guard. He's now 80 years old today. Rick is 58. And again, they've retired as a team. But in an NBC interview, the Hoyts said back in 1999, 21 years ago, Rick was asked what, uh, what else he would like to accomplish in life. Speaking with the help from that electronic device, Rick expressed his thankfulness for his father, and then he said, I wish I could be an athlete, but if I could have anything that I wanted, he said, I'd ask my dad to sit down for a while, and then I would push him around. And you think about that story, you know, God sees everything about our life. And he's willing and he has given us perfect guidance for a life that will bring happiness and joy, a whole lot less regrets, and a life that, again, we cannot uh, solve with the world system of order, our own ingenuity, 
Only God can provide that guidance and, and direction. And I hope that you'll follow him today and allow him to essentially push you through life on a course, again, that'll bring left, less regrets and self-imposed struggle that we often get ourselves into. And if you've left the course, God's course, for your life, I hope that you'll return tonight. And if we can help you in any way here at Weber Road, I hope that you'll contact us. Or if you need to come and you're here tonight, I hope that you'll come as we stand and sing the invitation song. There's a great day coming, a great day coming, when there's a great day coming by and by. When the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left, are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready? For the judgment day, there's a sad day coming, a sad day coming, there's a sad day coming by and by. When the sinner shall hear his doom depart, I know ye not, are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Now Peyton Hammett will lead us in our closing prayer. Will you please bow with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. We thank you for the many blessings you give to us every day. Thank you for letting us come here today to study more about you and to learn more about you and to learn more about being a Christian this past summer. We hope that as this country is going and the world is going through this tough time that we stay faithful and stay looking towards you. And in, this, in these upcoming months that we, we make the, the smart decision looking towards you and, and do everything that we can to please you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.